There it is. Hello, everybody, amateur astrophysicists and my God, the people that own the telescopes. There we are on the screen. We're ready again for a weekly virtual vlog we call the SBAU Astro Hour. It's our weekly podcast from our homes in lieu of getting to meet together at Farron Hall at the beautiful Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History on the first Friday night of every month, or set our telescopes up on the second Saturday at the star parties up at the museum. We're live even on YouTube for the morning, and we got five of us on board. My name's Baron Ron Heron. Let me do the headlines, then I'll introduce you to the Brain Trust. Today, we got uh, Venus and Mars gathering together all over the night sky this week. We'll talk about it. There'll be an Aquarian meteor shower later in the week. The battling billionaires, uh, you know all about that in the regular news. Richard Branson, Virgin Galactic went up and Jeff Bezos goes up in nine days for Blue Origin. And another comet is out there just beyond uh, Uranus. It's called Fay. I'm not sure if it's the closest one, but you can see it if you got a telescope. Nearest black hole. We may talk about that. Yes, there is one. It's only 1,500 light years away. My God. NASA is going to try a risky maneuver to save the Hubble. It apparently went dark on the 13th of June due to a glitch, an offline problem that put them offline. I guess we're not going to sail up there this time. They're going to do it from Earth. We're going to throw in some backup stuff. Uh, we got, um, whoa, the largest moon in our solar system. It's bigger than our moon, and it's bigger than Pluto, and it's uh, orbiting Jupiter. We'll talk about Ganymede. New type of supernova, if we can get to it in time, discovered by locally based Las Cumbres Observatories, a project of the Global Supernova Project. Now, let me introduce you to our president uh, on my screen just below me. Could be anywhere on this podcast. Good morning, Jerry Wilson. Good morning. I understand you and Tom are together in the same location because power got shut down at his place, but mm -hmm. otherwise it looks the same. Uh, president of the club now going into his fourth session with his lovely wife, Pat Forgy, in the background. We have Tom Totten in the other room, webmaster. Good morning, sir. Technical wizard, former president. His wife is Cezanne, and she's an absolutely accomplished artiste. We have Chuck McPartland, our outreach coordinator. Howdy, He's doing howdy. some outreach very soon, I understand. I'll talk about that here in a minute. And how's Pat doing, your wife? Just great. She's got all that merchandise stacked out in the garage, right? Yeah, it's in the living room. Oh, it's in the living room. <laughs> I was going to say, don't put it in the garage. The squirrels will get to it. But in the living room, the cats get all over it. It's Here in, it is it's at, in uh, plastic bottom. boxes. What? Big plastic boxes. <laughs> I found that I don't remember buying the second uh, uh, jacket or uh, sweatshirt, but I got two of them with a hood that I never use. People that wear hoods, I don't understand why they want to cut off their view on the side. But you see them all over the street. Hey, Tom Whittemore, who is our new Morning. editor. How are you, Thomas? Oh, He's fine, fine. Yeah, I changed the background. That's a grapefruit tree behind me. That's so I'm in the, the grapefruit tree. Okay, you and I have real backgrounds behind us, but that's all right. That's great. <laughs> Tom Whittemore bakes bread. He uh, used to teach science uh, in a lab out at uh, Westmont College. He's our connection there to uh, the big Westmont Observatory, and his wife is Maureen. And I hope uh, Tim Crawford is listening to us. He has his Tuesday workshops going, similar setup, right, Tom Totten? Yes. Tom, would you beam me up? <laughs> Say something, we need some reason we got an echo with Tom, but that's okay with me. Uh, basically, I wanted to uh, ask about, since uh, you sent this last minute, Mr. President, about NASA, we can't send people up to repair that Hubble. It was really repaired shortly after what about a year after it was launched in the early 90s when they put the wrong been repaired it's been repaired and updated twice that i know of that i remember one What's right the... after it because it was it had a vision problem so they we fixed it with some spectacles and then uh, uh later on it had its uh instruments and software upgraded hardware upgraded and now it's now it's a soft apparently a software failure or rather well could be anything i guess from what i know but they're going to try a software fix to reload um, a secondary, get a backup computer to take over. Is that what it is, a computer problem? Well, it's definitely a computer problem. Oh, it is, all right. A computer well, could be software or hardware or anything, so. 
let's face it, 1990s computers are nowhere near what today's computers are. Too bad we but can't go up. But the ones up there are radiation hardened, and that's why they have, they're kind of behind the times. Well, isn't it on its last legs anyway? Well, who knows? Huh? The lifetime of things in space is largely unknown. Um, you, you know, the rovers are made to last 90 days, and they've been going, some of them, for up to 10 years, I believe. And that's so. true. <coughs> and you do have to make a, a reservation to get on it, and, and you get an hour or two at a time. And Like all scientific research instruments, yes. You have to make a convincing case that your project is worth the time and the equipment and you have to have money to back it up usually. And then uh, a board reviews it and decides how to allow it, allocate time to, based on the needs and the importance of the research. Same thing with our locally based telescope outfit called Las Cumbres Observatories. Is that still headquartered out in Goleta? Or yes, it is. Well, they also released something that uh, you sent to us and I thought maybe I'd head off with that gentlemen. A new type of supernova has been discovered by the OAO or O, let's see, L A L C O. I got it. Project of what's called the Global Supernova Project. And I believe the word is electron crunch Capture. captured. Uh, you want to talk about it? Or I read the whole thing and I got a general idea. It's in between the two other types of supernovas, the one involving big red giants and white dwarfs. Yeah, that's the key. Okay, so uh, they have this network around the world. Uh, let me guess, uh, one meter telescopes? Is that how big their mirrors yeah. are? They're, they're one meter and they're, they're all um, the same design. They're clones of each other. They um, hand off uh, observations. So what is their catchphrase? Something like it's always nighttime or something or it's always in the dark. you in the dark 24 hours a day. Yeah. Right. And so this, what this, it is is most observatories up till this time, they have to open up at night, they do their research, and then they close down when the sun comes up. This okay. one, um, when the sun starts, the sky gets difficult because it gets bright, then they hand off to the next telescope around. So it really has a Earth-spanning inter-networked set of instruments, so observations never have to stop. It's been a major uh, improvement in a certain things that happen in a certain time frame and it's a world-class observatory. It's part of UCSB and they um, have postdocs work there and uh, students that are working on their PhDs. We've had some of them come and speak to us. What I Many learned, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, what? Many of them. Uh, here's what I came up with, SAGB stars. Uh, what is that short for? <laughs> giant uh, super giant branch. Super asymptotic giant branch, and uh, I've never heard that term before. S A G B. It's about you, but uh, more. Have you heard that before? Are you oh yeah. Aware? Did you read yeah. this? Mm -hmm. Well, anybody can jump in if you want. Apparently, supernovas are they're seeing one in a distant galaxy, NGC twenty one forty six. It's called uh, Supernova 2018 ZD. Are we watching it right now? That This is an artist's rendition of it. That's the right galaxy in the background. This, the white, the large white dot is the um, supernova. Huh. Um, it's probably it not? not being watched right now because they usually, well, the, the remnants of it are probably being watched, but it usually dies down quite a bit after the first two or three weeks. But this has to be based on what was seen in a telescope. Is that star way out on the fringe or totally out of the galaxy? No, it's the, the you see the, the galaxy is very oblique. So a lot of the galaxy, thinner parts of it extend out in a plane for this. Okay. So it looks like it's offset, but it's, it's still in the galaxy. But electron capture somehow becomes brighter, uh, not massive enough to uh, create iron. Is that a good... Uh, description of this something involving oxygen neon magnesium cores getting smashed into their atomic nuclei the electrons it's an it's an intermediate range mass of stars it's not heavy enough to go all the way to producing iron so this 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 one does the type of electron capture when the core of the of the um, supernova is uh, as shown in the graphic where it's got a lot of magnesium sodium neon uh, fluorine and oxygen is undergoing fusion, but mm -hmm. 
but that's as much as it's going to get. So it really? doesn't have enough um, heat. It doesn't have enough to collapse even more. It goes supernova at this stage. So it's an intermediate supernova. Intermediate. Well, would it be safe to say, gentlemen, if I understand what I read in your notes there, Mr. President, that the two types of novas, supernovas or hypernovas, whatever, are the smaller ones, uh, mass of the sun up to about eight or nine masses, and then the really huge ones above that. And this is somewhere in between. Chuck. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Chuck. Supernovas have to be more than like eight times the mass of our sun, generally. Um, so stars like our sun will not undergo supernova. Oh, well, there's a black hole out there that's three times our sun size. So something happened with that at some point. We're going to talk about that later. <laughs> right, but that's what's left after you get a star around eight solar masses that has mass loss and, and explodes. Okay. So can you talk masses as far as nailing down these electron capture stars? Are we looking at about a 10 to 12 solar masses, 10 to 12 times the size of the sun? Probably that neighborhood. That's pretty good size, but it's nowhere near a, um, a giant red, a gi red, red giant like Betelgeuse, you know, in Orion. Super like. giants, yes. Super giants. They give you, there's supernovas, hypernovas, and... What's the other one? Hi hypo? Kilo kilonovas. Kilo yes. kilonovas. Yes. Kilo Little neutron ones. Stars. All right. So the electron there's, capture one. There's also the bossa nova. Yes. Boss. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thank you. There's your joke. There, you, there it is for the day. Okay. okay Jerry, you were. So anyway, to... the, the two types were th uh, thermonuclear supernova and uh, the explosion of a white dwarf star after it gains matter from another star, a binary star. So that's a star like our sun, but it's in a double star system and it's been allows it to collapse further until it, the core collapse uh, causes it to explode back out. The, um, from a therm the surface uh, basically detonates and crushes the core and then it blows back out. The more powerful kind is an iron core collapse, which when uh, the fusion of the star's fuel goes up to iron and then it stops because it can't fuse anything higher, but it's, it, it and so the star stops sending out radiation and it collapses and then it bounces back and creates larger supernova. The electron capture one, as it says, is between two types of supernova, those two types. Uh, it, the, the stop, it stops the fusion when the core is short of iron. It, uh, as I mentioned, it has oxygen, neon, magnesium and they're not massive enough to create iron. But as soon as they stop their fusion, um, then the core collapses and then it blows back out again. Right, just got a feeling yeah. for this. Magnesium is element number 12, you know, and uh, iron, iron is number 26. It just gives you a feeling for the uh, masses of these things. Well, Whittemore, do you know what neon and oxygen's eight? And, right. Uh, so six, seven, and eight are really important because it's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. I studied my dissertation, magnesium. Uh, so I know that's number 12. I know it's a hexagonal close pack crystal. <laughs> um, um, neon, of course, is a noble, it's a noble gas. Um, mm -hmm. Well, without so this was um, um, the information came from Dr. Andrew Howell a no. staff scientist at Los Cumbres Observatory uh -huh. and, and adjunct facility at UC, uh, faculty at UCSD. Yeah, he's a great speaker, Andy Howell. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah. Doug, hasn't he spoken at our cl uh, club? Yes, he's he spoken has. at the club. He's come to the radio show. Um, yeah. He also, out at UCSB, um, came when we've had telescopes once and did a presentation with us with a slideshow. And of course, he was really wowing everybody because he says, I <laughs> had to study explosions. And so <laughs> he showed, you know, a bunch of experiments they did where they set off various amounts of explosives in different configurations to study core collapse. <laughs> right. And, and many, many years ago, uh, a, a number of us got a tour of Las Cumbres. And I think Andy was kind of the, the, the figure there. And he's really good with people. He just really good keeping a crowd excited, you know, about his physics. And, and does a lot of the astronomy on tap stuff too. Yes. Happening. Well, I had so anyway, a... we, the lead into the core collapse or the 
electron uh -huh. capture is um, I have a, a chart on simple basic fusion of hydrogen to produce helium. That is uh -huh. what our sun is doing now. And it starts with uh, two protons. They're labeled as P1 and P2. And those two go together. They, they combine and they, they emit um, an electron and a positron. That's the E plus and the new or neutrino. Neutrino, yeah. Neutrino, neutrino yeah. yeah. Neutrino. And uh, it new sub E. And that forms a proton and um, a uh, neutron. Uh, neutron yes, called a deuteron. deuteron, yeah, deuterium. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, another proton comes in, mm -hmm. joins with the deuterium uh, combination, and that produces helium three, an isotope of helium, because it's got two protons and one neutron. And then two of these things with the two protons and the one neutron, they combine. So now you have two neutrons and four protons, which is unstable. So it emits the two photons and you're back to the start again and you've produced helium. So this yeah. is the helium cycle that, that our right. sun is going through in the core right now. And in the middle there is a gamma ray and that's, that's oh. where the, a lot of the energy gets released. Right, that's what makes the sun shine is that gamma coming out. Thanks, Chuck. So yeah, thanks to Jerry, you can see that it's just a multi-stage process. Right. You know, get that helium. And, you know. and, the, and then as you go to much more complicated things, there, the, the number of cycles and isotopes produced as intermediate stages becomes fairly complex, but it's all mapped out in textbooks. Left to <laughs> interested students. But my question involves the protons. One proton in a nucleus represents hydrogen. Two becomes helium. I don't know how you throw in your neutrons, but the third. Well, no, a, a, a proton is made of a, um, no, a neutron is made of a. Of the two together, yeah. proton and electron. Yeah. I understand. Uh, but the lithium is element three. That would have been in the middle of that yeah. bottom of the. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't live very long, Ron. And you what? don't see anything there with three protons, Ron. Right. Well, how do we get lithium then? We well, the don't planet. in this process. Yeah, you don't. Lithium gets consumed easily in stars. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Very volatile. Okay, but it's also in our batteries and it's all over vast fields of desert in northern, I think, Chile. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that was formed by from other a methods. previous that was formed from a previous generation of stars. Yeah. Third, we're a third generation star, meaning we got all those upper elements. Well, second or third, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, and I, I learn more and more every week when I read your notes, Jerry, and uh, the, the gamma rays, if they were emitted from the surface of the sun, we wouldn't have a chance, would we? It'd probably go right through the ozone layer, but by the time they reach the sun after millennia of years, millions and millions, they're well, watered down somewhat, right? And become just light waves we can see. Right, no, right. they... Well, yeah, they do. They do have a very short mean free path, and they bounce around, get absorbed, and re-emitted a lot. But right. they're, they're still gamma rays. Well, um, the sun is mostly putting out. The surface of the sun is mostly putting out uh, photons in the in the green part of the visible spectrum. So yeah, I was going to say that. Rays. Right when I taught astro at um, at um, Westmont. Uh, I would work out with my students what Jerry was talking about. Basically, it's a random walk problem, okay, where in the core of the sun, where it's some 13 million or more degrees uh, Kelvin, you, you get the production of these gamma rays. And as they start to try to walk out, they, they collide, they collide, they collide with, you know, electrons and everything. And by the time they get to the surface of the sun, they, they become visible photons, okay. So, uh, and it takes, it depends on your model, but we used to use a model that it took several hundred thousand years for a gamma ray created in the core of the sun to finally work its way to the photosphere, which is the, the part of the sun that we see with our eyeballs. Um, it's a really neat random walk problem. It's really neat. But to go from gamma rays to light waves we can see means they've simply lost a lot of their frequency. It's not a super well, energy. Energy. Yeah. yeah, and their energy. Yeah, mm -hmm. frequency and energy are the same. The same thing. Let me go back to the first first stage of that. I kind of muffed that up a bit. The two protons, Oops. which is the E plus, which leaves an electron behind. 
So an electron and a proton left behind, that becomes the neutron and that makes deuterium. So a neutron and a proton is like the core of the nucleus of heavy water. Really? Yeah. Instead of a might, normal... If you took deuterium, it's uh, di-deuterium oxide, D2, yeah, D2O, and that, that's known as heavy water, which was a big thing um, for producing mm -hmm. nuclear energy during the Manhattan Project era. Of course, my stupid layman brain tries to figure out how in the world do you get two things? Why wouldn't they obliterate each other? <laughs> how do they live together? They orbit each other as countless atoms. They, the, the, the idea of an orbit is really um, an introductory analog. It's not really what happens. The things don't really orbit <clears throat> each other. They, have a, they exist in a cloud. Uh, a probability cloud. So if you touch two sides of an atom at once with your fingers, if you could, uh, you would feel the same electron at the same time mm -hmm. all around in the flow. So, of yeah, and Ron, you got to remember that this stuff is happening at severe temperatures, you know, at the core of the sun. So normally protons don't like to get together. That's what they call Coulomb repulsion, right? Because they're both positive charges, but it's so hot there that they, they caused this process, this fusion process to start to happen. Yeah. Okay. You, you mentioned 13,000 degrees Kelvin. No, no, mil, million, you know, it's, uh, you know, 13, million. 15 million Kelvins, million. Kelvins, yeah. Is, is Kelvin the same as Celsius? Yes, uh, they have a different zero, but yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the one change in one is the same as the change in at the other. What if one you is 273 degrees hotter than the other? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if you gave the number in Fahrenheit, what would the number be? Well, it sort of doubles what you're talking about, just sort of. Oh, I wish they could work that out and we could make a decision, sort of like decimals or, you know, the metric. Yeah, if, if you want, Ron, if you yep. want Fahrenheit, okay, you take nine fifths, which is almost two, nine fifths of the centigrade and then add 32F to it. So you can kind of say it doubles. It's good enough yeah. to say it. Close. We're still working on metric and English systems here. So <laughs> yeah, right. One temperature system is hopeless. I think it uses Kelvin. Yeah, Jerry, God forbid we'd use the Rankin scale, huh? Yeah, don't bring that up. <laughs> my problem is watching people from Britain in the desert saying, oh my God, it's 30 degrees. Right. Yeah, which here would be freezing. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, so it's not freezing. Well, let's so, go to the really nice picture of Ganymede. This was taken by the Juno spacecraft around Jupiter. You got it. And it is an extremely high resolution picture. You can blow it up. Uh-oh. 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 That's dumb, not good. Dumb, dumb. There we go. <laughs> there was a glitch, okay. ladies and gentlemen. We're back with a vengeance. Okay, so Linger. this is a really high resolution photo. It's got lots of interesting detail. You know, I just blew it up on my screen and looking around. Uh, it's believed to be mostly ice with water underneath of it. And a lot of the ripples and stuff are due to uh, sliding sheets of ice running into each other. Certainly, yeah, the older ice craters like on our moon. So it's a fairly young surface. And the older ice turns dark. So the, the blacker areas are older. Yeah. And, wow. these, and the craters on, on, the plant, on the Ganymede are very interesting. There's a central hole in each one. We don't usually see that on the moon. Matter of fact, I don't know of any craters on the moon that look like that sort of a bullseye function. Yeah. It's so bigger it than may, our moon it may and be Mercury. The, what, it, okay. What's that? It's bigger than not only our moon, but the planet uh, Pluto or Mercury? It, it's Mercury. bigger than Pluto. It, Mercury, I think. Yeah, bigger than... Yeah. So Pluto's it, bigger it, than... Crawford made a funny comment when he first saw this image of Ganymede. He says, hey, who put Copernicus on them? Yeah. On yeah. <laughs> <Not> him. <laughs> it well, sort of reminds you a little bit of Copernicus. He said, of course, Copernicus has these three little mountains in the middle, actually big mountains. Yeah. This, this is an inverse Copernicus. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a I was just wondering if the bigger crater, the bigger part of the crater was made when, when the whatever hit hit the, the ice and spattered it, and then uh, it punched through the sheet into the water below. Wow, yeah. And that's, that might be what the structure is due to. 
just mm -hmm. an amateur mm -hmm. guess. No, I didn't read it anywhere. But it's a it's a dramatic picture. Yeah, that's incredible. And that, that must be a very big, deep, uh, you know, crater. Yeah. You know, very, very large is what I'm saying, you know, side to side. This was taken by our Juno spacecraft, which is orbiting Jupiter, this picture. Yes. Yep. And it was only a thousand kilometers, which is about what, 700 miles above its surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty to. darn. That's closer than they usually get. And, and it altered its uh, trajectory or its orbit time around Jupiter. Did you read that? Yeah, it changes that depending on what it wants to look at next. Now, to the, to the left of center, there's a really interesting crater where it looks like there's a chain of smaller craters going yeah. through it. Yeah, I was looking at that too, Chuck. Really fascinating. But all these- Which uh, one are you looking at? To the left of center, where there's a left. bright white one along the rectangular black zone. Go more left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. More like, oh, yeah, that. A down, like, down, down. No doubt. Down, down and right. Down Tom. to the right, Mom. <laughs> so we're looking at mostly ice. That's down to the left. Go down to the right. With the. Yeah, Tom froze on us here. Oh, no, more uh, up now. See the white crater there's... on the top of that black rectangular region? Yeah. Right there. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Yeah. See, see that string of craters, it looks like, where something broke apart into multiple pieces and then wham, yeah, wham, 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 the wham. wham the yeah. There, yeah. yeah. And they think I, there's I, an ocean under this crust yes. thing, Will, of more water than we have on our Earth? Yes. Probably. That, that was what and, I read, yeah. And maybe some, and so the ocean would be liquid, but what we're looking at is crusty ice. Is that right? On yeah, the surface? On the surface. Mm -hmm. That maintains craters that's amazing that's that could be our moon but it's different isn't it <laughs> not nearly enough craters yeah. not enough yeah our moon because. is dry and there's this furrowed terrain too down more down into the left um oh yeah i'm sorry down into the right also yeah right in there yeah uh -huh. now one of the things i read about ganymede is it's tidally locked to jupiter is yes is it mm -hmm. Is it second or third out of the big four that we watch? Oh, I don't know. It's a number three. Out of the big four. Number three. Yeah. So we're not necessarily looking at the face, are we? That faces Jupiter. It could be Jupiter could be in the background, and it's simply facing the sun, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's definitely facing the sun mostly here. Yeah. Yeah. So is that the one? Uh, there, there's another one around Saturn that they're hoping Europa. Titan. Titan. No, Europa's uh, on Jupiter too. Oh, it is. Titan Enceladus is, is the one around Saturn. The what? Enceladus. Oh, yeah. I was going to say it's really interesting. You know, these things that look like quote seas, they seem to have almost rectangular geometric structures. That that's got to be pretty interesting to, you know, people studying these uh, this uh, moon. Well, Probably so has like... to do with ice. You know, ice yeah. crystal formation. Yeah. You call very different seas. from the lava-like stuff on our moon, you know, very different. Wow, fascinating stuff, gentlemen. Want to do the night sky for the week? Okay. We'll get, up, right. to, we'll get up to the meteor shower by Wednesday. Uh, suffice to say, you can't see Venus and Mars before dawn, but you can in the evening, right? They're Absolutely. Be, okay, yeah. they're going to be in the vicinity of the moon, which is a sliver. Mm -hmm. and, I took uh, some really good pictures of that, which is you can show now, Tom. All right, Tom, you find them, I'll read. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I'm gonna need my little light. Yeah. Um, close that conjunction. Looked like what it looked like last night. It was just beautiful. Uh, it, in fact, the moon, Venus and Mars um, were all within uh, my binocular field range. So it told me that they're within five degrees of one another. They're in here, here, Here's a little video I did. Okay. You did that, Tom? Tom Totten? Okay. Mars isn't showing up too well. No, you know, and again, oh, last time, yeah. Yeah. It, it flashes in and out there. Yeah, I, I couldn't get Mars with my eyes. Venus is extremely bright, and the moon yeah. was a beautiful little wisp. And it looks steady, too. Yeah, yeah. Tom says he took this from his roof. Okay. 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 They're all in limb for astronomy. 
Let's see. Leo is on the ecliptic. It's part of the zodiac. They're all three there, northwest of the biggest star, Regulus. Mm -hmm. Planets are, planets are three, 33 minutes apart. Closest will be in the early morning hours tomorrow at 3 a.m., but we can't see them. Invisible. What? Low, below the horizon? And in the U.S., um, maybe a better view tomorrow evening. Well, that's, we okay. that's okay. Tonight, tonight it's going to be really right. spectacular. Yeah, the moon will be the moon will be above Venus tonight, and then I, I believe Mars will be slightly below Venus. And you know, thirty three arc seconds. Don't forget, it's about a half of one degree, yeah. which which is the breadth of the moon, uh, full moon, the width of the full moon. When does that look at last night's earth shine on the moon tonight? Yeah, it, yeah. it's even pretty last night, Chuck. Yeah. Ah, you can see the ball dark. Mm -hmm. Tuesday yeah. the 13th, Venus will pass half a degree north of Mars at midnight in the morn, but you can't see it. Not visible. Instead, uh, see them at sunset when they're 33. The little mark means minutes, right? Right. It's not arced. <clears throat> to 11 degrees high, a half an hour later after the sun goes down, Venus will be directly northeast of Mars. Both of them easy to spot with a naked eye after twilight, as well as binoculars or small telescope. Moon will be a large crescent, larger, and will be 19 degrees close to Leo's hindquarters. The now tail. If, you look, mm -hmm. if you look at the first sentence in uh, on Tuesday, July 13, it says Venus passes half a degree north of Mars. And then later on, it says when they're about 33 minutes apart, which is also half a degree. <laughs> right, right. So, okay, go ahead. Is that right? 33 is about a half? Well, 30 is half. Yeah. But a moon is a half a degree, isn't it? In yeah, the, mm -hmm. moon, the moon's a half a degree or 30 minutes. Okay, a big triangle up there uh, in the tail of Leo formed from three stars. See if I get these right. Chertan, Zosma, and Denebula. There they are. Yeah, Remember that's the end of the lion. Mm -hmm. Ah, there it is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Can you tell me Indeed. anything about those stars? Are they binaries? Yeah. Are they uh, large red giants? Or If I could just jump in for one second. Uh, sure. Do you see, Ron, do you see that golden star there with the double? Okay. Uh, Tom, it's down to the right of your little pointer. See that up, there's a bolt bar. Great. Up, With, up, 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 up. Right, right, right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> is it near? Is it near Venus and Mars? You're talking about? It's above Venus. There, 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 there you go. go. So, so that star was kind of special to me because when I was first getting into telescope making and figuring the mirrors, uh, that star is also known as Algeba. I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but it has this uh, companion that's about four arc seconds away, and you can see it actually in this picture right there. And that was a test how well I was making my mirrors. If, if I could split those, I was on the road to a pretty darn good mirror. Okay. That's Even though right. they're four, four, four arc seconds, which is you could almost drive a truck through. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but this photo shows them apart so we can see them apart. Yeah. I don't, know that that's actually, I don't think that's actually the algebra double because four arc seconds yeah, right. It would not show up. <laughs> yeah, it's approaching our seeing level, you know, here. Yeah, the moon is 30 arc seconds across. Yeah. yeah. 30 minutes, yeah. excuse me. Well, so how it's, far probably, it's probably not the companion uh, to Algeba. Yeah. That was that was just a special star for me when I first started testing yeah. there. Okay. And it's what, about the front part of the back of the, the lion? It's, 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 a head. Sickle, it's yeah. the sickle. It's his head. It's a, in his neck, kind of. Yeah. The yep. uh, constellation stick figures that this planetarium program draws are not the ones I'm used to. <laughs> yeah, this looks like the one from H.A. Uh, Ray. Yeah. H.A. Ray, what is that? Oh, Great he's, book. <laughs> oh. Yeah, he's a guy that, that had a, he made his own drawings of the constellations that he thought were better. But when I was first good. learning about the stars, I had his book, you know, it's a great book. Okay, well, shall we go to the meteor shower Wednesday the 14th, gentlemen? Ramping up somewhere, let's see here, peaks at the end of the month, uh, and the moon's filling up a little, so you're going to lose some of your, um, well, get, gain a lot of brightness, lose some of your darkness. You may see a few sporadic meteors starting Wednesday the 14th. Meteors have long tails, tiny pieces of interplanetary dust burning up brilliantly in our atmosphere. 
The shower is radiant. You're going to have to tell me that that's the source, I assume, where they come from. It's, it's where they appear they're... to come from. Right. Okay. Right. The radiant is 10 degrees west of the third magnitude star in Aquarius. To give it a name, it'll be highest for the northern hemisphere viewers in the pre-dawn hours, the sky in the south above first magnitude star, Formalbot. Is that about right? You pronounce the T? Form Formalo. Formal no, it's a French word. You Formalo. <laughs> <laughs> I always said FOMAL out, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's an H. No, I mean, I mean it a B. FOMAL. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, it's and an H. What is Pisces astrinus or astrinus? The southern fish. Southern fish. <laughs> southern. It's a different from the our it's, Pisces? Yes. Oh, it's yes, right yes. on the horizon in this image that's showing yeah. here. It's right down there where it says southeast to south southeast. If you picture a court, if you no, that's that's Pisces. We're talking Pisces Astrinus, Tom. So it's more down by where southeast and south southeast, mm -hmm. right on the horizon. Wow. So that, you know, when I when down, I started down out, right, Tom, down more to the right, right there. There's Fumalhout, and that's the mouth of the southern fish. And Aquarius is pouring water out of a jar into the mouth of the fish. Yeah. So that would be Australia's Pisces, I guess. They <laughs> they see it. It's the Southern Hemisphere Pisces. Yeah. And so when I started out with this in 1959 and 60 with my six inch telescope, this time of year, Fomalo was the most Southern star, bright star that I could see with my scope. And it appeared just about that high above the horizon in a notch between two hills from my backyard. So I had to time it just right to see it. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's also, in a very lonely part of the sky. I mean, you know, lonely. There's a lonely part of the sky. Are you kidding well, me? Well, not star. Yeah, not star studded. <laughs> it's often called the lonely one. It's the only first yeah. magnitude star in that area. Yeah. How right. come we didn't get the deep field from Hubble there then? Anyway, uh, also, let's see here bright Jupiter and distant Neptune. And you're going to need a telescope or binoculars to see them. The moon, as we say, will continue to widen, disrupting the meteor shower. Do you guys do meteor showers? Some of them are I, bigger. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My my enthusiasm for them is waning though, because um, about five six years ago at Calstar, my son and I were laying in um, um, Chase lounges next to each other watching meteors. And he goes, oh, look at that one. That one's a real bright one. And I said, where was it? He pointed right where <laughs> I was looking. And I didn't see a thing. Yeah. So he was on drugs. My eyes are getting, losing their sensitivity. <laughs> you want to tell our vast audience why they buzz and you can hear them? That's an electrical thing, isn't it? Transmission or sense? It's not sound. I don't, I don't, I don't know think why anybody's that established that for sure. But it's, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a magnetic disturbance. Well, there's several showers during the year. Which is the brightest? No, I, I kind of like the Perseids. The, the Perseids, <laughs> Perseids and, the, and the Geminids are the two big ones. Yeah. And they've and already they happened. They, no, sometimes, no, no. It's a, sometimes it's a very dramatic show with some showers, and sometimes it's really blah. Right. And sometimes the moon's around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that too. The Perseids have a good moon this year, so they'll, they'll yeah. be nice. So well, that it's hasn't in, happened yet? It's in August, uh, Ron. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah, uh, I showed the uh, the sky at one o'clock in the morning for the meteor shower radiant because okay. at that's uh, in the morning from midnight to sunrise you're on the front edge of the Earth in its orbit, so you pick up more meteors there because you're running into them. Uh, in the evening, you only see the meteors that can catch up to the Earth. It's like a rain in a rainstorm driving in a rain. You get the rain on the wi front windshield only. You doesn't hit the back windshield. Um, <laughs> I'm tempted to bring in some uh, sentimentality with you guys and your lady friends who you married. Uh, wondering if you've ever laid out on the grass and watched meteor showers in your younger oh, yeah. days. You we, don't, or did we I, go to? <laughs> Thursday? And I drove up to the to the gun club on West Camino Cielo for the Perseids one year. And I backed my car into their driveway, sort of, nobody was using it. And we were lying on the hood watching the, the Perseids. And a sheriff's car came up and whammed a spotlight on us. <laughs> and I said, what are you guys doing? And I said, we're watching the meteor shower. And he, he says, oh, sorry. And he turned off his, <coughs> and he turned 
off his spotlight. And then about uh, 15 minutes later, he came back because the road ends pretty soon there. He yeah. came back and he, he got on the microphone and said, your night vision will return in approximately 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's got to be people with wide lens angle lens cameras that tape the whole night. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, oh, uh -oh. Here we go again. again. Get us um, back on, Tom. Um, Shall I do Thursday? Like nothing's happening? Tom this seems is... to have disappeared here. <laughs> oh, it did stop, didn't it? If he's gone, we're in trouble. We may not oh, be on. Back. Tom, Totten, please. He got beamed up. Yep, there he is. First you go echo on us, and then you disappear and go up to the Enterprise. How are you, Tom? Are we back recording okay. on YouTube? Yeah, the connected. internet connection is unstable here at times. Yeah, welcome to the club. Well, I guess yeah. you're in my house, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexis, or whichever one Siri works for us. Uh, next I, year. I should throw in real quickly uh, before we go to Thursday that uh, sbau.org is our main number in case you're new. We are on YouTube, and you can leave comments. And tomorrow night, there'll be a telescope workshop. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes. Yes. Are you going to take part, Mr. President? Yes. You're usually on board, aren't you? Yeah. I missed last building? week. I was feeling poorly. Tom Whittemore is involved with that, too. Early risers <laughs> Thursday, the 15th. Started, started it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm missing yeah, lately. Just, just lately, you know, there's been a lot of astrophotography, and I just, you know, I, I don't participate in that stuff you know i can hardly wait till the workshop comes back live you know yeah so. there's nothing I, like hands-on is there actually right. grinding you, you've, been, you've been to it ron you see how, how yeah. needed it. yeah but i'm i'm not online tuesdays because i wouldn't be able to contribute a thing i'd just take up space on the screen and make your pictures smaller and we don't need that <laughs> but are they archived can we see them replayed just like yes. these programs we yes. do the podcast Here's Thursday sky, gentlemen, the 15th. The early risers look east to see Mercury, magnitude minus 0.6, nearly three degrees high just before sunrise, sitting just seven minutes west of magnitude 2.9. Tejat, 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 posterior in Gemini, the twins. Mercury shows a 67% lit disk. I'm not sure what that means. Two thirds. That's a phase, like the moon. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. So it's mostly on this side of the sun, or is it the other side? Hmm. Well, it, it goes around. It's right now. I don't know which side. If it's what is it? It's over half lit. It's on the other side of the sun a little bit. That's right. That makes sense. Right. So it's not a uh, Venus-style crescent or whatever. Uh, spans six uh, seconds of the sky. The disk. Uh, see here. Okay, um, it's going to brighten later, sinking today toward the sun, approaching its superior conjunction. Does it uh, cross the sun or it gets swallowed up by the light and there's no it way does. we can see it? It does what? transit the sun occasionally, but uh, not right, not this time. Yeah. Yeah. But we are going to lose it. That's pretty much it for Thursday. Taurus the bull is in there. Oh, the uh, Hyades and Pleiades, star clusters. Yeah, this is a very rich part of the... Um, sky for interesting faint fuzzies oh yeah aldebaran is the uh, bright red eye to the bull that's right yep. mm -hmm. bull's eye mm -hmm. okay well i don't recognize the bull yet is that it on screen is that the cast yeah. no those are the two yeah. horns of the bull oh that's yeah. the whole actually, oh. actually one horn is borrowed from another constellation <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> one horn or two and where would yeah. aldebaran be Right. It's that red, it's that big red dude right there. Yeah. See where he's oh. got the cursor. Is Aldebaran a red giant? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is it soon someday gonna blow up on us? Maybe like Betelgeuse? It's a red giant, not a red super giant. Oh, okay. Just a big one. Okay. We uh we got about a quarter hour to go. Let's go to Friday, two hours after sunset on Friday night. Uh look south. And find Scorpius, constellation the Scorpion, bright red heart and winding tail, also home to the closest globular clusters to Earth that are known as M4. Mm -hmm. 7,200 light years away, that's as close as you can get. There are more than 100,000 stars uh, spanning a whopping 36 
uh, what, more than a full moon? 36. Um, yeah, teeny, teeny, teeny bit. Um, <laughs> minutes. You know, 2% two, two bigger. Yeah, very easy to see from our backyard and binoculars. Now, now, this time of year. Oh, and, oh that's a year. You can see there's sort of a vertical concentration of, of stars in there that's a little bit brighter. Uh, yes. Especially shows in binoculars or a telescope. And because of that, it's called the cat's eye sometimes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Are and those cat? This one shows a number. Of, what? This one shows a number of red giants also. Yeah. 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 Oh, boy. This is full color these days. Wow. Yeah, I see them. And there's nothing in the middle of uh, something like that, like a black hole, to cause it to be sort of like a galaxy in a way. Some, some of them have it. Yeah. Do they really? And so a lot of those stars are mini orbiting, not only orbiting our galaxy center, but its own center, perhaps. Their orbits are pretty complicated because they're so close together. It's more like a swarm of bees. You know, you probably couldn't trace a simple ellipse of one star as it goes around the center of the whole group. Be it's interesting to see. Wonder what science says when two two uh, galaxies collide. What happens to the globular clusters? They must. Some stars must collide. These well, no, are globular clusters, some stars collide. And so you find what are called blue stragglers. Most, most of the stars in, in globular clusters are very old and they're yellow or red, but some are anomalously young looking and they think that's where two stars have managed to collide and merge. Really? They don't blow up like a supernova or something? Well, they get hotter. Yeah. <laughs> and they may turn into something that will supernova yeah. relatively soon. There are there is speculation that these were um, that the globular clusters are the leftover cores of small galaxies that were captured by our galaxy at some earlier time. Yeah, especially and Omega Centauri. Right. Interesting, fascinating. Does yeah. science know what happens when two black holes collide? Is there any chance of anything exploding away from it, or is that all? Yeah, this yeah, yeah. You see, you see gamma ray bursts and things. Yeah. Was that right? Something would manage to get out, get away. Yeah, and, and you get gravitational waves. Oh, God, yeah. But for some reason, I'm, it's hard to get those. It's got to be a real cataclysmic event to produce them that are measurable with our LIGOs, right? On climate. We'll, we'll get more sensitive as time goes on. <laughs> All right, let me uh, finish Friday. This Friday night, the 16th of the merry month of July. Uh, we're out there in Scorpio. Uh, winding tail and home to the closest globular clusters, as we said, 7,200 light years away, 100,000 stars plus, whopping 36 minutes more than the full moon. But its glow is spread out to um, 5.6 magnitude, difficult to spot with the naked eye unless it's very dark. Also, uh, M4 sits behind clouds of gas and dust, making it dim and reddish. It's about uh, 1.3 degrees west of bright Antares, the main alpha star. What is an alpha star? What does that mean? Brightest one. Supposedly. Bright, brightest one. Yeah. Sometimes called the Lucida. Sometimes called the Lucida for mm -hmm. the constellation. Is there a term beta star? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But not as bright. Right. They used to, they used to call them alpha, beta, gamma in order of brightness, but that doesn't always hold. Right. right. Okay. So this is the summer Milky Way and near the core of our galaxy. And the constellation here is Sagittarius, but the pattern that's made, the asterism that's shown here is called the teapot. And where he had the cursor, that's the spout of the teapot. And then the Milky Way rises like, uh, yeah, don't move it around so much. I can't, <laughs> I'm, not looking my eyes. Yeah, I'm starting to get sick. It, uh, it shows the steam coming, the Milky Way, which is not well shown here, comes out like a steam out of the spout. And you yeah. can see all these um, objects, M16, M17, M18, um, M8 up here, the big red one, the Lagoon Nebula, and then above it, M20 and M20, which is the Triffid Nebula, and then M21, which is a star cluster next to the Triffid Nebula. But this, you can just put your scope around anywhere up here and find all sorts of yeah. uh, impressive things. Um, it doesn't have to be a very big scope either. It's a wide angle scope works is, is far more impressive. 
This is a close right. up of the Tripit Nebula in the lower left and the star cluster M21 in the upper right. Mm -hmm. Tripit, I got my notes somewhere and I've lost. Tell us about Tripit. Is that part of the, is that in Scorpio? It's in Sagittarius. No, it's in Sagittarius, it's, 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 it looks like it's in three parts. Okay. That's sometimes called the propeller there in the middle. <laughs> And that's a nebula. That's the. It the, looks to me like a really angry cat in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the colors are accurate. Red yeah. on the bottom. What do those colors mean? You suppose. The red is the reddish is fluorescing hydrogen, and then the blue is where uh, light is being scattered off of dust particles. Yeah. And that's the remnants of a star that blew. No. 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 That's a big gas producing. This is uh, ejected material from all sorts of things, from solar winds and uh, planetary nebulas blowing up and, and even novas, but generally it's just the, the leftover star forming stuff from the galaxy. You can see in the lower left, you can see a dark thing right there. Um, and at the end of it is um, a concentration of dark material. So that's in front of the nebula and it blocks the light and that's why it looks dark. But these things, uh, they can concentrate and form what's called Bach globules. And you'll see something on that in a little bit. Uh, gentlemen, I found my notes on it. It's in Sagittarius, you're right. M20, the Trifid Nebula, a couple hours after sunset, should be dark enough to uh, start searching M20s above the teapot, which is an asterism. It's not an official constellation. We right. have a big teapot up there. Interesting. Seven and a half degrees due north of third magnitude Al Nasi. Is that how that's mm -hmm. said? Al Nasal. Al Nasal. Yeah, yeah. That's an L, not an I. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nebula centered in the double star H N 40. Is that right? Do I got that right? H N 40. Whose components glow at magnitude uh, eight and nine. Ooh. Yeah, that, that's that's a good picture, Tom, because uh, what you see here are two really wonderful globular clusters near Caus Borealis. M22, easy binocular target. M28, a little more difficult, but I can get in the backyard binoculars. What do you suppose Caus means? Oh, good one. Chuck, do you remember that one? Mm, uh, no, different. I don't remember. It, it could be something like um, hooves. But yeah, but, but oh, what, yeah, that, that could be because Borealis, of course, means north, right, Chuck? Yeah, yeah, Borealis and Australis, it's missing a U there in the other one. It means northern yes. and southern. Yeah, you can see in the middle, Media, you can see yeah. north, Borealis, and then you can see in the south, Australis. In, in the usual drawing, that's a bow with an arrow with Al Nazel yeah. is, is the end of the arrow. So maybe it means, you know, top of the bow, middle of the bow, and southern end of the bow. Yeah, that good, makes point, sense. good point. Uh. For a second there, I thought it was named after an old friend of mine who repaired Volkswagens up on State Street, Klaus Brown. <laughs> yeah. Klaus is out of body. Okay, yeah, I found those. Uh, you want to talk about the comet? Gentleman sure. named Faye. Uh, that's uh, way up there, uh, out there in Aries, next to Uranus. Yep. And there's a finder chart for that. 10 magnitude okay. glow, easy to spot. Really? Yep. Easier than to spot the planet, probably. There it is. There we are. The okay, where is the far one on the star left map? Is the Pleiades. <laughs> Got a small stubby tail extending northward. And it says less than two miles. What does that mean? The rock is two miles across the comet? Maybe the nucleus estimate. That's a big rock. If we ever had a comet, it would be over <laughs> like the dinosaur, wouldn't we? Where is it in the diagram? Oh, here it is, path of comet. So is it on the yes. right side at the bottom end of that arrow? On July um, 1st, but you know, now we're near between the 10 and the 15. Gotcha, there we are, Path of Comet Faye. There's a, a white line uh, under the H of Path, and that's about where we are. So let's uh, review real quickly, gentlemen, if you don't mind, on my behalf, comets. They come from the Oort cloud or from the Kuiper belt or from the Trojan. Oh, they can come from anywhere. Really? Uh-oh. Please. Chuck is the host now. 
Terry. <laughs> well, well I will turn it over to Tom. <laughs> okay, he'll be right back. I'm sure he will. Well, anyway, uh, you gentlemen are watching it in Aries and Uranus. Is that a regular viewing planet anyway? As it just happens to be in the vicinity. What about those other comments? We, what? It just happens to be in the vicinity right now. I mean, I, I don't know about other observers, but I tend to not look at those much except at public outreaches because the public wants to. All right. Okay, if you look in the finder chart that he's about to put back up, you can <laughs> see in the background, um, you can see a lot of stars have Greek letters. In the very tippy top upper corner above triangulum is the Greek letter alpha. And then um, I don't see a beta, but that would be the next brightest star in that constellation. Of course, this spans several constellations. Yeah. <clears throat> and then there's a gamma over in the top middle near the word, near the letter N. And then there, Hamel, below Hamel is a kappa. And across from it is a, a lambda. And then a, there's an eta a below Hamel and an iota below Messerstem. And, uh, so and an omicron. What's that? And an omicron over there by eta. Yeah. And a sigma near omicron. Rho, epsilon, psi, delta, tau. So right. these run the gamut of stars from brighter to dimmer uh, uh, in, as a zero order. Uh, not always true, but the intent was there. And so they run generally run through the Greek alphabet. And I believe we had this That's come up that, last yeah. week. A triangulum is, is that a slave galaxy orbiting our galaxy or is that a star? It's a constellation. Triangulum, triangulum is a small dim constellation. There's a triangulum galaxy, Messier 33, that's part of kind of the local, well, a little, kind of the local group, along with the, the Andromeda galaxy. It's just slightly right. farther away, like 3 million light years. Okay, what are we watching though on this diagram? Is that the galaxy Andromeda. or? There we go. Well, we got about two minutes, gentlemen. Uh, is it possible, Mr. President, to uh, <clears throat> maybe promote what we may get into next week, a diagram of the extra galactic distance ladder from Hubble? We can, yeah, we can do that. But there's a cool graphic uh, video that I'd like Tom to show now, a GIF uh, right above the nearest black hole candidate. That would be the Talk distance about. ladder. There it is. This, now, this, this will, we'll get to this ladder later. But this is a video of the occurrence, of the observation of super of a supernova from through the 20th century up to this part of the 21st century. It's a dramatic oh. video that shows how uh, better we are now at uh, finding supernovas and how many there are each year. Thousands a night, even. Yeah, thousands. Really? He's got a he's got a fetch of a video there. For, there it goes. But no, there was one this that... This is, see, 1903, it starts at 1900. And each dot that you add, that's a supernova that was seen by the instruments of the day and identified as such. And see, it's starting to get more populated now after World War II. Okay. And that, then we get into the, around 2000, we get into the instruments and satellites that, that we have up there that do this thing um, tremendous fast, tremendously see. Wow. Wow, I had no idea there were that many. I thought they were a rare occurrence. Interesting. No, nope. okay. Well, we'll get it get into it heavier next week, I guess, gentlemen. Yeah. We uh, appear to have run out of time, but uh, sure. keep sure. that in mind. We'll call that up again and maybe get past our Edison Company shutdowns and Cox Cable losses, and we're okay. We're on YouTube, and, <laughs> and we're, still, we're still at home a lot. Uh, we don't have our masks as much, and uh, some of us are going to be driving electric cars, I've heard, very soon. I, I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, I heard that, too. Uh, we missed to Bruce Murdoch. He had a doctor's appointment, but let's do it again next uh, Monday morning, the podcast we call the SBAU Astro Hour. Thank you, Toms. And thank you, Chuck. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. President. We will thank see you. you guys next Monday morning, 11 a.m. Austin Nebula. All right. Thank you, Baron. <laughs>